in, in you know bringing it closer to, to Singapore, where does ASEAN fit within within this this you know coalition building alliance uh, approach? Well, I think that the the Biden administration's approach to ASEAN has been um, complicated a bit by events in Myanmar. Uh, the Biden folks had you know high ambitions of getting off to a fast start with ASEAN because you know, they, they sort of look at the Asia region and, and they take an outside in approach of working outside of China to try to forge commonalities to deal more effectively with China. Uh, but the, you know, the unfortunate reality is that um, Myanmar has really thrown um, a, a complication into their plans. But the, the facts thus far uh, are that President Biden has included uh, references to ASEAN centrality in his uh, joint statement with the other leaders of the Quad uh, when they met uh, last month. It was embedded in the joint statement that uh, he and Prime Minister Suga released last week. Secretary Blinken has called uh, every ASEAN counterpart with the exception of his counterparts in Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. And uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, has also met with ASEAN leaders or ASEAN ambassadors in Washington. So um, I think that they, they've gotten off to a slower start than they want to, but I don't want to oversell the point because there has been uh, you know, steady work that's been, been done. My expectation is that as we move closer to the East Asia Summit, that uh, we, we should see an uptick in activity. At least that's my hope. And I, I see Ambassador Ong Kang Young nodding and, and Ambassador was the uh, Sec Gen, Secretary General for ASEAN, um, a, a, one of the you know, Hall of Famers in, in the Singapore uh, foreign policy and diplomatic community. Ambassador, do you want to just comment for a moment on ASEAN now? I know I'm putting you totally on the spot, but I know you well enough to do it. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Well, I think uh, for the moment we are inundated with all these doing and flowing about Myanmar. I am just uh, happy that the U.S. administration He's still uh, holding his uh, hand a little bit. Uh, in other words, uh, not throwing the full blast of uh, what America can do <laughs> with regard to sanctions. Yeah, we hope that the ASEAN leaders can uh, uh, measure up and uh, do something constructive. Uh, it is now a bit more complicated than last week because uh, the elected uh, members of uh, parliament in Myanmar together with On San Suu Kyi have formed their own little uh, formal group to challenge the military leaders. Uh, but I think uh, let us see what the ASEAN leaders can uh, uh, deliver when they meet at the summit they plan to hold later this week. I think on Saturday uh, in Jakarta, the capital city of Indonesia, where ASEAN Secretary is located. Hopefully, there can be some kind of uh, uh, positive development, which most importantly, at this moment, stop the violence against the protester on the street. Yeah. Uh, thank you for interest on ASEAN. Uh, but we wish that the Biden administration can uh, be more proactive on other aspects of ASEAN community building. There are many other things that ASEAN is doing. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan, for that uh, comment on ASEAN. Thank you, Ambassador. And in, in Ryan, we, you know, within ASEAN, obviously sitting here in Singapore, we're all interested in, in watching the, the US-Singapore uh, relationship, which is one of the strongest uh, diplomatic relationships the US uh, has in Asia. Now, the US has said it's, it's not going to, you know, make countries pick between the U.S. or China. Um, that's easier said than done. So what do you think, um, how is the Biden administration going to do that? Because we're going to start talking about sanctions a bit uh, in, in Xinjiang, and we're talking about ASEAN and, and Myanmar, and we can talk about the South China Sea. How do you do that? Well, Steve, I anticipated that you were going to ask this question today. So in preparation, I reread Prime Minister Li Xianlong's uh, foreign affairs article last summer. And, um, you know, what, what he talks about in that article is the, the risk to the region of allowing US-China rivalry to spiral out of control. 
if either the United States seeks to contain China or China seeks to establish an exclusive sphere of influence, that could, that could derail the momentum that the region has. Um, I think it's, it's valuable to raise that concern, um, but I have less concern about it today than I did four months ago um, or, or 20 months ago. But to, to try to put a few ideas on the table for people to react to, uh, I think that it is helpful uh, for leaders in the region, particular thought leaders such as Singaporean leaders, to make clear on a uh, consistent basis, candidly, quietly, uh, to offer counsel to, to leaders in Washington and Beijing about their intolerance of either of those uh, outcomes. Um, I think it would be helpful to try to find opportunities to pull the United States more deeply uh, into the economic fabric of the region. Um, the, the reality is the United States stands on the outside right now, and I think that we in Washington uh, feel it pretty acutely with RCEP, with TPP. And these are problems of our own making, but um, the, they are a reality. So how can we, given that reality, find ways to integrate the United States more deeply into the economic structure? Would a digital trade agreement uh, that brought together, say, the United States, Japan, and Singapore, and then built out from there, uh, provide a basis or a foundation for some of this integration? And maybe uh, do I'll, I was gonna I won't do the follow up. I'll ask uh, uh, Kian Ming Ong to to do the follow up on CP TPP and and uh, he was the deputy uh, minister uh, for Medi in Malaysia. He's still a member of parliament uh, in Malaysia. His a strong advocate for for that type of regional architecture. Thanks. Yeah, th thanks, Steve. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, just wanted to get your thinking about the possibility of uh, the Biden administration re-engaging with uh, CPTPP. Of course, now we see the rhetoric is uh, much more focused on bringing local uh, manufacturing uh, back to the US. Uh, I think probably as a hedge against uh, what Trump was uh, saying uh, during the elections. But I think moving forward, uh, everyone is anticipating or looking forward to a more coherent and comprehensive strategy on the part of the Biden administration towards ASEAN. Uh, and uh, you know, top of the list would be the CPTPP. And uh, I can tell you that uh, you know uh, many uh, of us who are in the manufacturing sector, looking at FDI into ASEAN and including in Malaysia, are also very uh, looking forward to seeing what uh, you know the possibilities are for the Biden administration to signal their intention to rejoin the CPTPP. And I'm sure Steve would be very happy about that. <laughs> I think everybody in AmCham Singapore would be happy about that. Well, add me to that list. I would be <laughs> delighted as well. Uh, I think it was a mistake for us to pull out in, in 2017. And uh, it's, I, I, th I think that it's widely acknowledged that it was a strategic mistake, uh, but a political reality in the United States. Uh, for the foreseeable future, I think that the political headwinds will remain strong. Uh, but I am cautiously optimistic um, for a couple of reasons. One, if President Biden is able to make progress on his infrastructure initiative, get some of the foundational aspects of the building back better um, agenda in train in the United States, I think that will uh, create some political space for him. And secondly, my expectation is that the more that the president is able to travel to the region, the stronger of the demand signal he will hear uh, from his counterparts in the region. This was similar to the process for President Obama uh, he did not enter office thinking that uh, TPP was the, the path forward for the United States, but he heard uh, loudly and clearly and persistently from his Asian counterparts about the strategic imperative for the United States to get involved, and it had an effect. I can tell you from firsthand experience, it had an effect on his own thinking. So uh, I, I wouldn't write off the possibility, uh, even though in the moment, uh, you know, on April 20th, 2021, sitting in Washington, D.C., it doesn't look like uh, a high probability. I, I think that's, that the logic is just too strong uh, for the United States to abandon or ignore uh, this approach for too long. You know, and Ryan, we, we, we've had a, a very active first TPP committee and CPTPP committee at AmCham Singapore. And I think that's a message for us is that we can't give up, even though uh, we may have to change and show the benefits to US jobs to show what this means for literally wages in the United States, uh, if there is TPP to advocate for labor environment, sustainability broadly, but we, we can't stop. I think that's, so it, it's great to hear that, that that work that we did in the region did it have an impact back in, in the White House. Absolutely. 
And if I could just add one more idea for you or others to react to, um, to the extent that there are concerns in the region about US-China rivalry sort of spiraling out of control, the more that the, the United States and China get pulled into dealing with common challenges in the region, uh, I think that the, the, the higher the cost of allowing rivalry to overtake the relationship becomes. And I don't have any, you know, any silver bullet solutions here other than just the general observation that, uh, that if we can find ways for the United States and China to be compelled to confront common challenges, I think that that will serve uh, to create space for Singapore and others not to be pressed into uh, being forced to choose sides.